hello and welcome to, uh, I'd like to offer a very warm welcome to both the on-site and online audiences uh, for uh, this panel around uh, Caroline dodds pennock's new book On Savage Shores. My name is Dr. Philip Abraham and I'm the uh, Deputy Head of the Eccles Centre for American Studies here at the British Library and uh, we have sponsored this panel because uh, the subject of Caroline's marvellous new book uh, aligns very closely with a number of research interests that we uh, have supported and pursued over the past few years here at the library. Uh, I'm not going to um, bore you with an extensive narrative about the Eccles Centre, but I think the, the main message is if you're interested in this talk, there's probably something that we can do to support your interests in uh, Indigenous American history. So check us out on the internet and please come and use the British Library's wonderful collections of uh, First Nations and Indigenous and American material. First of all, some housekeeping. Um, we'll be taking some questions at the end of the session. Uh, for those on site, a handheld mic will come around. And for those of you online, you can submit questions using the question box below the video. Books uh, on site attendees will have already seen that Sarah and her team at Blackwells are outside with a number of books uh, relevant to this talk and other talks throughout his fest. Um, and the event will have live speech to text captioning and BSL interpretation. And this is accessed by a tab below the video for anyone who would like to use it. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for this session. Uh, Dr. Adam Rutherford is a British Professor of Genetics and Biosciences, a Sunday Times best-selling author, a broadcaster and a columnist with over two decades of experience in science and the origin of life. He's presented many shows for the BBC, including his latest for BBC Radio 4, Bad Blood, The Story of Eugenics, which I must say I enjoyed hugely. Very good. <laughs> um, he is the author of many critically acclaimed books, including A Brief History of... It's not of about me, it's about her. <laughs> I've got all your books there. Um, but you are right, I will move on to the main event. <laughs> uh, Dr. Caroline dodds Pennock, and this really is very exciting. I was just saying to um, Caroline, because uh, both Caroline and Adam, I think, are the two, are the last two non-terrible people on Twitter, so I've sort of been... <laughs> <laughs> I've sort of been watching the evolution of the research process of this book for a number of years, and it's been very, very exciting and um, really, really uh, a much needed and very, very timely book. Um, uh, Caroline is the senior lecturer in international history at the University of Sheffield, Sheffield and the UK's only Aztec historian. She really has done the work and learnt the languages and, and ploughed a very needed field in a quite lonely intellectual terrain in this country. Uh, her first book, Bonds of Blood, Gender, Life Cycles and Sacrifice in Aztec Culture, won the Royal Historical Society's Gladstone Prize in 2008. Uh, but she's here to speak on, on Savage Shores. So can we have a nice, lovely British Library welcome to Caroline and Adam. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. That's a very generous introduction. And I think um, the, the last least terrible people on Twitter is our new shared bio. Yeah, we should put that in our bio. Yeah, definitely. So we, we are here to talk about uh, Caroline's brilliant book on Savage Shores, my favourite history book of the, of the year, undoubtedly. You might have heard it on Book of the Week on Radio 4, also on Start the Week on, on Radio 4. And I liken these introductions sometimes to describe them using the blurbs because the work has already been done. Benjamin Zephaniah described it as mind-blowing. This is how history should be taught. Um, Peter Frankopan, you'll all know, a thrilling, beautifully written, an important book that changes how we look at transatlantic history. This one, I think, is particularly eloquent, both epic and intimate, and a thrilling revelation. Caroline dodds Penick is the perfect guide to uh, uh, shifting the axis of global history away from its Eurocentric grip. That was me. Um, <laughs> and described by Dominic... Sandbrook in the Daily Mail as woke nonsense. <laughs> so another reason to buy and love this book. <laughs> the Sunday Times. Sorry, the Sunday Times, he described it as woke nonsense. Anyway, um, it is a book about um, Mesoamerica and the narrative that we are told is embedded in our culture and our history of Europeans discovering America, of course, has been... You know, heavily revoked in the last few years. Um, this book is the story of how Mesoamericans and Indigenous Americans discovered Europe. And really, I think it's, it's, it's sort of uh, one of the earliest descriptions of true globalisation, not just Europeans coming to America, but Indigenous peoples coming back to Europe. Caroline, to start off with, 
Can you just give us a paint a picture of what Meso America, what the Americas looks like pre Columbus's contact, the diversity, the people, the languages? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a huge question, isn't it? Yeah, and thank you for the very generous introduction um, to both of you. Um, it's it's such a large continent, I think people don't realise the incredible diversity. I mean, in Mexico alone, there are still over 60 recognised indigenous languages today, and we know that hundreds have been wiped out. If you factor that up across the continent, then the diversity of peoples and cultures was incredible. We have everything from the very urbanised civilizations of Central America, where you have, um, you'll be familiar with the big temples at places like Tikal and the, the Mayan civilizations, the um, Aztec or Mexica civilization, as they would have called themselves, they have these big urban centres of at least tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people, bigger than the cities in Europe at that time going through to nomadic peoples, to transient cultures, to people living in small settlements in the northeast, it right all the way up to the Inuit um, and Caribbean peoples who are on the coast. It's just an astonishing diversity of cultures who often get lumped together as if they're a single group of people. And they're no more a single group of people encountering Europe than all Europeans are the same going the other way. And we often hear about the population being decimated over the next couple of centuries. Um, as a result of European contact. What about the population size itself, especially and, because we're going to focus in on Central America, Mesoamerica, but, but how many people are living uh, in the Americas at this time? That is a gigantic and very debated question <laughs> because uh, we only have statistics from Europeans after what's already been called by indigenous people the first great dying to work backwards from. So you factor that number upwards and people get numbers from between about 100 million to you know, 500 million. It really, really depends um, where, how you do those statistics. What we do know is that with the best case um, statistics that we've got, so taking the lowest possible mortality rates, and the lowest possible population figures, something like between 50 and 80% of indigenous people have died within the first 100 years after invasion. It's an absolutely astonishing statistic. And, and what about the preservation of the cultures and the languages? So you mentioned that there are, what, what did you say, six, 60 languages I think it is. Are, are still preserved today. As a historian, what are the, the texts and the artefacts that you are looking at in order to construct this, this history? Yeah, it's really difficult because so much is destroyed by Europeans. And so people talk about the Aztec Mexica people as being non-literate, but in fact they have an incredibly rich pictographic literary culture, including things like legal records, and they are simply all destroyed uh, by the Spanish because they're afraid of their corrupting potential on Europeans. They think they're all religious. And so, and, and many other cultures rely on oral histories or pictographic or physical records to, to preserve their, their histories. So we're really relying on um, documents that are produced after invasion by Europeans. Sometimes, of course, after invasion, we have many, many records written by indigenous people themselves under the aegis of the conquest. Uh, and you do have lots of incredible work being done by scholars on indigenous language texts, as well as by indigenous communities, recovering their own histories, relearning languages that have sometimes been deliberately erased. Um, and also, of course, there's been incredible preservation of those histories among communities themselves. But it, you have to unpick these stories from um, in European influences more often than not, especially in the Atlantic world, you're more often than you are not dealing with sources that were written either by Europeans who saw these people or who kidnapped them or enslaved them um, or just observed them and thought they were, they were curious. We do then have everyday stuff like baptismal records, legal cases. There's some amazing legal records, uh, especially freedom suits. People are, who've been enslaved are appealing for their freedom and we get to hear their stories in their own words through those histories. Um, and then you also have, of course, diplomats and high status travelers who write letters and, and records themselves. It just depends on the period that you're looking at, but often you're dealing with little fragments and you have to put lots of fragments together to make a bigger picture. And I, I wouldn't normally ask this, this question in front of a general audience, but this is a, a bunch of history nerds. So <laughs> I, I, I wanna ask you about your process in this as well. Where, where are these texts? Where are these 
these, these records and the artifacts? Have you traveled extensively? And how do you learn to even pronounce some of these words? You try and fail and try them again and you listen to indigenous peoples and ask them how to pronounce them some of these languages though aren't spoken anymore um, so we have to best guess them from uh, close indigenous cog kind of cognate or indigenous languages i haven't uh, traveled that much i have done some traveling but i haven't traveled that much partly because i have a small daughter and also the covid really did put a dampener on my intentions to go and visit lots of the places that are in the book. That was something I was planning to do during the, the writing stages of the book, was to try and go and be in some of these places and see what they must have been like and experience them, and then, bam, we're all in our houses. And, of course, digital has allowed us to do so much more than we used to, to see what places are like. And, and um, so this book does use a lot of archival records from places like the Archive of the Indies in Seville, uh, which is where my research started. I started off as a historian of the Aztec Mexica world, you know, working on that period. And when I started the book, it was going to be a more specialist book about Mexicans coming to Spain. And then the more I wrote it, the more I realised that there were all these people from all over the place coming. And if we see them as part of this bigger movement, you can really flip that script of travel and see this as a, a much wider, more influential, more interesting, well, not that scholarly work isn't interesting, but, you know, a, a more um, kind of dynamic, transformative process of indigenous people discovering and influencing and changing Europe. It's not just about a few people. We're talking about tens of thousands of people just in the first hundred years. And so... As I started to research, I, I used... Um, they, I'm not the first person ever to notice that any of these travellers existed. That's the fascinating thing. So I do have other people's work to start with in some cases. So amazing scholars like Jack Forbes, Nancy Van Dusen, um, Jose Carlos de la Puente Luna, who've all done <laughs> specialist bits of work. The interesting thing is that even though we have this specialist, these specialist bits of work, they don't seem to have made any impression on our broader sense of this period. Even academics often don't know about these travellers. So I was talking to Susanna Lipscomb, a wonderful Tudor historian, and she said she didn't know that there was a Brazilian king at the court of Henry VIII. And she's a specialist in Henry VIII. And so and he she, was there for a year. He was there for a year. And, it, and I didn't find his presence in a kind of hidden source in an in a archive that nobody's used. It's published. It's written about. And if she doesn't know then, you know, the, the wider public certainly are unaware of all these travellers. And so I began to branch out and see it as this bigger project. Well, I, I remember having this conversation with you probably three years ago, um, mm. because I, I'm not a historian, but dabble in, in history as a scientist. And, and I didn't know any of this. And, and so the, 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 the broad narrative, which I know we recognise Columbus was a monster now, and that is slowly changing but to discover that tens of thousands of people were coming from Central Mesoamerica to Europe and the influence, uh, the, the lasting legacy is absolutely fascinating. And that's what the book is about. We, we do have to deal with Columbus in order to get us into the next, uh, what is the meat of the book? Um, what, hap what really happens in 1492? Well, I mean, Columbus, <laughs> so... Uh, he thinks he's trying to find India, doesn't he? And he bumps into the Americas. This is the famous story. Columbus 1492 sails the ocean blue. And he does, in doing that, sort of start a process that will open up the world into what we see now as the beginnings of globalisation. What people tend to focus on, though, is Columbus going to the Americas, discovering, in heavy inverted commas, because, of course, you can't discover a place people are living. It's like me coming around and discovering your house. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, and but, then killing everyone. And, and then killing lots of people. <laughs> Kills a lot of people. Um, some through disease, of course, many through diseases that people have no immunity to, but also through enslavement. And when we think about the transatlantic slave trade, we do not think about indigenous people being brought east. It's just not part of our popular perception. But Columbus alone has licenses for 3,000 indigenous people enslaved to Europe. And if you think those are just the people who are being brought legally. So the first time he comes back in, to Europe in 1493, he brings with him a group of Taino Caribbean island people. Uh, men and women, um, including one man who 
we know is sort of the first person in a way to come to Europe voluntarily because his wife and son are kidnapped and they're on board Columbus's ship and he uh, rows out to the boat and says, can I come with them? Don't take them without me. And they, they take him with them. We don't know exactly how many of these people survive the voyage, but about seven, six or seven, uh, land at Palos on the coast of Spain and create a great stir, of course. There's something entirely new. People have never seen people like this. And they're watched by lots of people as they're taken to court to see Ferdinand and Isabella, the rulers of Spain. And when they get there, there's this incredible ceremony where they are baptised, these people are baptised, um, taking the names of Ferdinand and his son, uh, royal godparents and so on. And then after the baptism, the, the royals fall on their knees weeping. It's this amazing... And, and the choir sing like this. It's, it's this incredible piece of choreographed theatre that's all about the recovering of new souls for Christ. And what the indigenous people thought was going on, goodness knows. <laughs> um, and, but they're often sort of just seen as objects in a piece of theatre that's happening there. But actually, we know that a lot of the objects Columbus has brought with them are actually gifts from indigenous Taino rulers, for example. So they're surrounded by stuff that they have brought. And, and two of them, it seems like, were um, family members of the Taino ruler who had met with Columbus. So they may well have been there voluntarily as sort of diplomatic figures. One stays at court for a year uh, and learns to speak Spanish, and, and he lives there for a year before he dies. Um, and another one becomes a translator for Columbus, Diego, who is apparently adopted as like his son, is what the sources say. Whether that's true, we're not sure, but we do know that he travels back and forth with Columbus and then settles in the Caribbean and kind of takes advantage of the position he does, he's gained in order to promote himself and his family, it seems like. So you have all these different pathways, people who are being enslaved, people who are, it seems, conducting diplomatic exchanges, people who are becoming translators, and, and that's something I'm trying to get at in the book, is those multiple experiences. When we have seen these people, they're almost always seen as two things, as exceptions, like there aren't very many of them, there's this one strange, isn't it a strange case, and as um, subjects of things that Europeans are doing rather than agents in their own right. And those are, the, I think, the two main things I'm trying to challenge. Yes, and you're incredibly good at sort of jumping between, you know, detail of things like legal documents and how people are being perceived and also the grander narrative of this, the movement of, of these people. But you just mentioned something which I think is really interesting because it's not one class or group of people. There are the enslaved, there are explorers, there are diplomats, there are traders. And that first wave, which I think was 1493, mm -hmm. with six or seven people, um, how, are they, how are they viewed? Are they, are they curiosities or... Are they well-respected or are they something else? It's a bit of both. So they certainly are seen as curiosities, especially because Columbus brings with them parrots and gold and new kinds of foods. And, and so they definitely are seen through this lens of curiosity by a lot of people. Apparently so many people crowd round to see them at, that um, you know, they have to, to try and um, part the crowds and so on. There's always people staring at them. And I think that's a shared experience for a lot of travellers. Not met, not all, by any means. There are some areas where they become the norm and, and everybody will have seen them. But certainly a lot of the earlier travellers, this, this experience of being a spectacle. But then they all are also, in this period, very respected because you don't have a kind of skin colour racism in this period as the dominant lens through which they're being seen. The dominant lens is whether they're Christians or not. And the Spaniards are legitimising their power in the Americas at this time on the basis of a papal bull. The Pope says, you can have these lands on condition you evangelise them. So they have to accept this, and this is a big difference from what happens in North America and what's now the United States. They have to accept that these people are potential vassals, converts. Um, and so... Isabella, in particular, goes to quite uh, great lengths to try and protect the indigenous people. I mean, of course, it's incredibly paternalistic and it's protection to become Hispanized and become Christianized and you should give up on your own cultures and all of that sort of thing. But she is not trying... She, she constantly is saying to Columbus, why are you enslaving these people? Stop that. You know, famously, she says, who is this man who enslaves my vassals? And, I mean, I don't want to 
overstate the, the beneficence of the crown, it does depend on who's in charge. So the minute that Isabella dies, for example, her husband Ferdinand sets about issuing slave licenses all over the place because there are all these exceptions to the, the fact that you're not supposed to be able to enslave indigenous people. But they do take seriously this need to try and convert these people. And what that means is that, if you, that, that they also try to ally with the indigenous peoples because they're very aware that people like the Portuguese and the English are also looking at this territory and saying, well, maybe we could get in there. Well, and, we, and without the Christianization motivation. Yes. This is very much coming from the Vatican. Yes, absolutely. And so the Portuguese have the territory to the east with a similar ball. This is, they've just divided up the world. You have this bit and I'll have this bit. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous when you sit back and think about it. But what it does do is really influence what indigenous nobility can do at court. So they come and they say, you know, we Christianized at the first possible opportunity. And so we're going to need you to support us in uh, giving us money, uh, troops, making sure that we get our privileges that we used to have. We don't want to pay tribute. And as we pointed out at the beginning, there's a massive diversity of peoples here. So uh, by 1521, when the capital of the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan, has fallen, you not only have the people who were conquered, you have people like the Tlaxcalans who helped the Spanish conquer them because they were enemies. When the Spanish arrived, the Aztecs were not popular with everybody. So the Spanish ally with the Tlaxcalans and then the Tlaxcalans in this post-invasion world position themselves as allies of the Spanish and they say, we're going to need these privileges. And, and, and the Spanish go along with it because you have to remember there are only very few Europeans in the Americas. So they need alliances, allegiances, indigenous structures to keep their power in charge. They can't impose it all through force. So they recognise... Sorry, I've wandered a little way from the original question, haven't I? They, yeah, they, you've actually covered my next three questions. Excellent. Which is not unproblematic. There you go. It's, uh, the, but so the, the point is, though, that it, the Spanish recognise what they call the señores naturales, the natural lords of the land, and they ally with them. And, and who those people are influences how you're treated at court. So if you come to court and you're a prince of an indigenous civilization, you get lots of money and treated really beautifully. There's a famous case of a ruler from Zacatecas who is um, captured actually for being a rebel. And even though he's at court and been taken to Spain in order that he should be tried for his part in the Mishton War, they, because he's a, a, a ruler, he gets treated really, really luxuriously and is able to call on all kinds of funds from the crown. Um, and he has servants, he has um, uh, money to bring over family members. And, and so how, how you're seen depends massively on who you are, what your background is, what your status is. In a way, you might say that class matters more, and also religion, whether you've converted or not, matters more than indigeneity. And I've got lots of questions about... The, the, the willingness with which Christianization uh, occurs. Because it's, it's, it's hard for, I, I mean, I find it difficult, even, even in the book, trying to understand mostly the narratives are coming from texts from Europe, which say, you know, and these people accepted Christianity. What, what does it mean? What, what were they actually doing? Was it tactical or did they embrace Christ as, as Spanish would have done? Well, I'm sure some people mm. were genuinely converted. I mean, well, that's entirely possible. But in most cases, it seems that either the indigenous peoples adopt Christianity as a, a convenience, so they just add it on to their own religion. Because if you're polytheistic, you can, you can say, oh, yeah, we've got space for another god. <laughs> um, I mean, the Aztec Mexica already have been taking, like the Romans, they have a similar process to the Romans. They conquer gods of other territories and they put them into a house of captured gods in their city. So they're very, oh, yeah, bring Christ, that's no problem. Put him, we'll put him in as well. They also, because remember, they're trying to translate concepts across languages that do not neatly fit. I mean, it's hard enough to explain the Holy Trinity in a, a language that everybody you're talking to speaks, let alone across languages. It's incredibly hard. There's a famous example uh, of the word sin. So the word that the Spanish always translate from Nahuatl, the Aztec language, as sin is tlatzoli. But actually, that word means more like stuff or dirt out, things that are out of place. 
and you need some of it for things in the world to happen like fertility and childbirth. Um, and you, but if you have too much, the world tips out of balance. But they translate this word as sin. And so they think that when the Aztecs are talking about Tlatzoli, they're talking about bad things that need getting rid of. It. And that's not what they're saying at all. So there's a, there's a real miscommunication there. So every time the friars are saying, you've been committing sin, the indigenous people will be hearing something really, really different. So you get a lot of uh, what's called syncretism, this blending of religions. You get a lot of convenient conversions. So the Tlaxcalans frame themselves as the bringers of Christ in the Americas. There's this amazing source called the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, which is a big sheet that the, they produce in the 1550s, which tells the histories of their people, which is intended to be sent to court to, to, to Charles V. Um, and in the middle of it is a big cross being raised by Spaniards and Tlaxcalans and all the Tlaxcalan communities around and lords looking up at it. And they, so they frame themselves as the bringers of Christ immediately. And so they take advantage of that very, very deliberately. Of course, then when we go up into what's now the United States, you get a totally different framework where some communities are, they're not even bothering to try and convert them. They're simply seeing them as savages in, in you know, heavy inverted commas, because that's a racial slur, that's what they call them, as, as barbarians, as animals, others where they are trying to convert them and you get, it, get a degree of accommodation. It really depends enormously. Um, uh, what is the... I think that I'm interested in, in, in terms of my background as a geneticist is how families become integrated and how the movement mm -hmm. of populations changes the demographic structure and indeed the genetic structure of, of peoples. We know that Columbus arrives and one of the first things that happens is the rape of Taino women in 1492. It, it's very striking how quickly there is integration between European ancestry and Mesoamerican ancestry. But again, it's very diverse and it's, it's, it, it, yeah. it varies from people to people. Yeah, absolutely. And how consensual it is is incredibly oblique in the sources because even if something is theoretically a consensual relationship, if there's a power dynamic, then how do you tell what's happening? Um, and the fascinating thing is that that mixing is happening on both sides of the Atlantic. So, And it's not just in places like... Spanish America, where, of course, you've got large numbers of Europeans already and, and indigenous people going the other way. So as early as 1505, you have um, indigenous people coming to northern France who are being brought by the French to places like Rouen. There's a famous case of a man called Essomeric, who uh, possibly Itamirim, which means uh, little chief or small chief. And he is a Tupi man, um, and he's brought by a man called Gonville, who leads an expedition to um, South America, uh, to the coast of, of what's now Brazil, and he brings a, this, this man, Esomeric, who's the son of the chief, and uh, another man, Namoa, with him. Now, Namoa dies on the boat, and uh, thinking about our discussion about Christianity, they then have this very heated debate about whether they should be baptising these indigenous people, even if they don't know quite what's happening, because it, should they die unbaptised, and then their souls will go to to hell. So they decide to baptise Esomeric and they've promised Esomeric's father, Eroska, that they'll return him within 20 moons. But when they get to France and he goes to Enfleur, he lands in Enfleur where Gonville's from, Gonville never manages to get the money for another expedition so he gets stuck in France. And so Gonville, as far as we can tell, the records are really difficult because he then changes his name to Gonville, which is, and there are lots of Gonvilles around there, so it's quite hard then to trace him in the records. But as far as we can tell, Gonville um, marries him to one of his uh, relatives, Marie Moulin, and they have 13 children. And then he has seven more by another French woman. Now, there is an argument, and he becomes a, a kind of important um, in the fabric trade around there, as far as we can tell. Uh, now, the problem is that some people have argued, because the first source we have for Esomerique is about 100 years later, one of his descendants, that it's being invented, that he didn't really exist, because what happens is that the French try to bring in a tax on foreign families. And the descendant says, this is totally unfair. We shouldn't have to pay a tax. He got stuck here by accident. So he writes this, he, he says he goes and finds all the records and writes the big history, but the actual records have been lost. We just have this account that he uses. The thing is, for me, 
it doesn't actually matter that much whether Esomerik was real or not. I mean, it, yes, it's amazing if he was, and it's an incredible story. But the French sources show that there are lots of people being baptised and getting married all around northern France in that period. You have records of six people being brought um, in 1509, I think it is, to Rouen. You have um, individual baptismal records for all these different cities. And so ordinary people and also important people, like um, the woman who's come known as Catherine of Brazil, right at the beginning of the 1600s are already becoming ordinary in northern France, in the lowlands, as well as in places like Spain, where there are huge numbers, uh, and, and Spain and Portugal and, and, and all around there. So it's an exchange that's a kind of that genetic exchange you're talking about is on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm. You know, indigenous people are becoming uh, normal parts of people's families really right as early as the beginning of the 16th century. And um, w one, of the, one of the sort of myths or w one of the narratives that we historically teach or talk about is that the Spanish were on the hunt for gold, which I think you, you, know, you deal with very adequately. We've sort of mentioned it already, but just talk a little bit about trade. Mm. And the, the, I think many people will know that chocolate and chili and potatoes are all part of this movement, but there's so much more. And what is brought, not just by Europeans to Europe, but by indigenous people to Europe is, is fascinating. It's really fascinating. And it's so, it was a really tricky part of the book, actually, because so often in the sources, in, the indigenous people are separated from the stuff. So trade records just in, talk about the, you know, we brought X amount of chilies or X amount of tomatoes. And, and those narratives have been really appropriated by European stories. So when we think of tomatoes now, we don't think of indigenous people. We think of Italian cooking. When we think of chilies, we think of West Africa or uh, Indian spices. You know, th those goods have been separated from their indigeneity. And so I thought it was really, really important in the book to try and reconnect those stories. Um, I mean, when we think about tobacco and potatoes in Britain, you know, we think about Walter Raleigh, don't we? Tobacco and potatoes, pioneer in, in, in England. But people are smoking and eating potatoes in Europe long before Raleigh even thinks about going to the Americas. So why have these kind of narratives of discovery and, 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 and encounter become appropriated in that way? And part of it is because we've forgotten that there are indigenous people there. Um, my family and I went to York's Chocolate Story not so very long ago. And at the beginning, they have a room before they get into all the stuff about fries and how, the, I don't know what it is, 99% of the chocolate oranges are sold at Christmas or whatever it is. There's a room about the history of chocolate. And they kept saying things about indigenous culture. And my mother-in-law would look across at me and she would say, is that true? I'd say, no. <laughs> this one? No, not that either. And it was absolutely fabrication so much of it and the, the relevant part is that they said that Columbus and Cortes brought the secret of chocolate to the Pope and the King of Spain and they kept it a secret and this is based on absolutely nothing at all <laughs> it's literally made up it's just made up in reality although we know that there is one shipment of cacao that is recorded earlier uh, in the 1530s, the very first people who are recorded making drinking chocolate in Europe are Maya lords. In 1545, a man called Arpot Batz, um, who is a Kechi Maya from Chamelco, in what is now Chamelco in Guatemala, he comes with a group of other important Maya lords with um, goods representing the wealth of their realms, including chocolate, platters of fruit, all kinds of ornate objects and they appear at court it's an amazing story actually i can't tell the whole story a lot of it, it it's in the book but the what's brilliant is you you get this 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 is a really well recorded story there's the sources for it are really rich and they include community sources that we didn't know about until recently a woman called ashley kistler did amazing community work and they showed her a document that they've been keeping that records the voyage where it's been copied, the original is basically uh, um, illegible, but every few decades some, they recopy it and recopy it, and, and they have people who are community keepers of this history. 
And what actually is interesting is that, though, from our point of view, they're the first people to make chocolate at court. And it's this great story where they're at court and Philip, Prince Philip, who they're going to see, hears the songbirds and he comes rushing through the palace to see what they've brought. And then our pot bats refuses to bow to him because he says he too is a king. And partly for this reason, in Chamelco, he's like a local hero. He's seen as the man who saved that community from the destruction that happened around. He agrees to become the first Maya Catholic in the region. He voluntarily converts. We were talking about tactical conversion. He voluntarily converts in order to prevent invasion of his community. Um, and he, uh, they have this amazing history which shows that what they care about is not the chocolate but the quetzal feathers. They brought thousands of quetzal feathers. And that, for them, is what's really valuable in the transaction. That's the only thing their record talks about. It's this community, we brought 200, and they brought 400. They're making sure everybody gets their credit for who gave the Quetzal feathers. But from our point of view, chocolate is the, is the, the kind of exemplar thing. It's really fascinating. It is a brilliant story. He um, asks Prince Philip for more uh, friars, and Philip says, oh, we'll send you some of the, the black the flock friars of the black robe, which is the, the Franciscans, and, and the source says that he says, no, 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 we want the ones with the white robes, which is the Dominicans, and I'm sure that the fact that the Dominicans are the ones making the record, recording has absolutely nothing to do with this. Um, but he goes back with so much stuff from Philip, including these huge silver bells, which um, I don't think it made it into the book in the end because I, I got very carried away with this story and my editor's like, you cannot tell all of this. <laughs> They bring the bells back, and the bells are so massive, they have to des designate one of them the keeper of the bells. And they carry them across this swampy ground, and one of them sinks right in, and they can't get it out. And supposedly, you still hear the bell ringing at night, say the community. And Again, I have been expansive in my response. Um, sorry. This is, I mean, that's a story that didn't make it into the book. So if you get an idea of what a storyteller Caroline is... Just the bit about the bells. I mean, I think that... But you can see the other bell in the church is, is at, at Chamelco still that came from court. Um, let, let's talk about Britain. Let's talk about the, the presence of Indigenous people in, in the UK. We'll, we'll, I'm going to open it up to questions. I can see many coming in already online. Um, but I've just got a couple more. I've got a couple more questions to go. But let, let, let's talk about the presence of, of indigenous Mesoamerican people in, in Britain. There, uh, an unnamed Inuk man in um, 1576. Who is he? he, he we don't know what he's called, I, as you said. <laughs> um, he's from Kikiktaluk, uh, which you might have heard of as uh, Baffin Island. He is kidnapped by Frobisher, who is there looking for um, gold or a, a black ore that they think may be something to do with oil or, or, or some gold, something like that. And he is kidnapped and brought to London. And um, he creates a great stir and he's, he's depicted from life. Unfortunately, he only lives a couple of weeks. He bites through his tongue as he's being captured and um, dies of what they say is a cold at sea. It might be pneumonia that he died of. There are actually lots of images of him. We know they make a death mask of him, a wax uh, likeness of him. Where, and and is that a, is that, does that still exist? The wax likeness does, but the, the, several of the pictures still exist. Mm. Three of the pictures, I think, still exist, though we know more were made. Um, and he is buried at St. Olav's Church in London. Uh, it's, um, you can still go and uh, go to St. Olav's, it, it's largely as it was. Uh, but then the fascinating thing is that only a year later, in 1577, Frobisher goes back and he kidnaps three more people who are called Arnak, Nutak and Kalicho. And Arnak and Nutak are um, mother and baby. Their names actually just mean uh, mother and baby or woman and baby. And they think they're a family. The, the Europeans think that they're a family, but they're, they're not. And so the sources show they're actually very respectful of each other. They look after each other, but they, um, you know, don't... Uh, they they emphasise that the man and the woman don't um, have sexual intercourse or anything like that. They're just very respectful of each other and of their nudity and all of these things. And the amazing thing about it is that we do have depictions of them from life as well. You might have seen John White's pictures of indigenous people on what is now the North Carolina coast. He makes these famous paintings, um, watercolour paintings, and he paints them from life. And when you look at the pictures, they are, they're in the book, um, and 
they're wearing their traditional parkas. We get words like parka and moccasin and anorak are all from indigenous languages, so many indigenous language words that, that come to us and are another just kind of hint at this influence. But in the image of Arnak, there's a little baby just peeking out from her hood and that's Nutak, the baby. Um, are, they arrive in Bristol uh, where both Arnak and Kalicho die um, after not very long there. Kalicho again was injured in his capture. And it's astonishing, we actually have the account of an autopsy record done by a man called Dodding who looks after um, Kalicho in his last days and then does an autopsy. And it's, he's had a brain, it's clear he had a brain injury during his um, capture, broken ribs. And Dodding also diagnoses him with a thing called anglophobia, um, <laughs> which is an amazing description he gives essentially of a man pushing on a brave face in a situation he does not want to be in at all. Um, he, they force Arnak to witness the burial of his dismembered corpse apparently to prove that the English aren't cannibals. Yep, brilliant. Why you would have thought that they were, goodness knows. But she then dies probably of measles and both are buried in Bristol at St. Stephen's where they're, they're actually doing some artistic work around the burial of the indigenous people. There's a lot more to this story, but just to conclude it, um, um, baby Nutak is brought to London and put on show in a pub called The Three Swans and he lives only eight days and then is also buried at St. Olav's near his compatriot. And both of them, their burials are unmarked. They're not in the parish records. There's no memorial to them. And how many people know that there are two Inuit buried in St. Olaf's in the middle of the city of London? Everybody knows that Samuel Pepys is buried at St. Olaf's with his face staring out at his wife across the nave. That's why most people go to the church. But nearby are these two indigenous people, including this tiny baby who was brought to London. That's, I think... New tax story is the one that sticks with me most after thousands and thousands of lives mm. that I've looked at. Um, you mentioned cannibalism there and the, the, the British regard to ca cannibalism. A, a thing that I noted, which I thought was fascinating, is Michelle de Montagne concluding <laughs> that they are no less brutal, the cannibals are no less brutal than the way the, the British and the Spanish treat them. Yes, so it's, he's one of the very few, he claims to meet three, well, he, seems to have met three people in Rouen, where, uh, as we said, a lot of Indigenous people were, and he uses his meeting with three Indigenous cannibals, as he calls them, to reflect on how barbaric Europeans are. He, he, he's one of the very few people in this period who seems to understand that there's a relativity to this, you know, like, well, you know, they're violent, but then we're pretty violent too, you know? It's, it's yeah, absolutely. And, and one more, because I think it's really important how you identify individuals and you name them, and, they, and it brings... You know, it brings their history and the grand sweep of history to life because they're real people stories. Um, Manteo and and um, we, you've mentioned Walter Raleigh already, mm. but there's a the, his his translator or his his um, colleague that helps him write this history who lived down on the Strand. Can, can you tell us about that? Oh, that's a big long story, isn't can it? Can you tell us it in three minutes, please? <laughs> So, uh, in 1584, two men um, from Croatan and Roanoke called Manteo and Wanchesi are brought to London and they go to live in a house owned by Walter Raleigh, um, or, or given to him by the Queen anyway, um, where they live with a, a man called Thomas Harriet, who produces what is called the first indigenous alphabet. That's the traditional story, that Harriet produced the alphabet. But what we know now is that Manteo, at least, and probably Wanchesi to some extent too, are working closely with him on the production of this text. Of course, they must have. You know, how could he possibly have produced it without indigenous collaboration? Um, but he, Manteo is often written out of, of that story. Now, Manteo becomes a close ally of the British and goes back and forth across the Atlantic, and he must have become part of the circles that Raleigh is operating in. He's certainly met lots of intellectuals in London. He becomes the first baptised Protestant Christian uh, of indigenous uh, descent. They give him a gun, which must mean he must have been very allied with them because they don't like giving indigenous people guns. And he, the end of his story is that um, he is left with what became the doomed Roanoke colony that, that disappeared, you know, the, and left the words Croatan, on a tree um, and uh, people have said oh this is a great mystery but it seems most likely that Manteo who was from Croatan simply took the starving people back to his community they, they assimilated 
to indigenous ways in the end. Um, the one very small sidebar, because I think I'm probably under three minutes, is that when Walter Raleigh falls out of favour and is put in the Tower of London, he actually has an indigenous servant alongside him all the time that he's in the Tower of London. And nobody ever talks about that. They talk about him growing sassafras and writing his history of the world, but there's an indigenous chief alongside him all that time. One more. Because <laughs> you're good at doing it very quickly. That was, that was less than three minutes. You mentioned at the beginning when you were talking to Susie Lipscomb about, about the presence of this of a, a Brazilian king mm. in the court of Henry VIII. Tell us more about that, because he was there for a year. He was there for a year. So he is brought by the most... We don't know his name. He is probably a Tupinamba man um, from the Brazil coast, and he is... We, so we have to call him the Brazilian king, because that's all we have, that's all we know about him. He is a ruler who seems to have come voluntarily because they leave a hostage, an Englishman as a hostage, for his safe return. Uh, so he must have negotiated to come, and he comes to court and meets Henry VIII several times, lives in uh, London for nearly a year. Unfortunately, he dies on the return voyage, um, but they do seem to have managed to convince the indigenous people of their good dealing because they released the hostage, for, fortunately for him. Um, so... In this period, we think we know really well. You know, people, you say to people, what period does everybody know? Well, Tudors and Nazis, right? Everyone knows the Tudors and the Nazis. But how many people know that there was a Brazilian king at the court of Henry VIII or that they mocked up human sacrifice at the court of Charles V in Spain? It, it, or that there are Inuit people who go to the court of um, uh, Elizabeth. Or it, it, they, these people are there all the time, and yet they're just not being talked about. And, and the legacy that we've talked about in the food and sometimes in the language and p potentially genetically as well, we've, we've touched upon. I'm, I'm going to open up to questions now, and I'm going to start with a question that's come online from Katie Barrett, which is quite simply, did they stay? Some of them did stay, yes. Um, so the period the book looks at is the first hundred years or so, when things are most in flux, because that's a period when indigenous people have, I think more flexibility, more agency. It's before power structures are fully established. And, and it's those beginnings of globalisation. And, and I wanted to speak to that period that people don't know as much about. So more of it is about uh, Spain and France than about Britain. So what I would say is similar... Th we have these amazing cases in Britain, and, and similar cases do happen, but it's smaller numbers in Britain. So we don't have a large indigenous diaspora in Britain from this very beginning point. I should say, Cole Thrush has an amazing book called Indigenous London that talks about indigenous peoples from all over empire coming to London all the way up to the 20th century, which is great if people are interested in that. It has walking tours of indigenous London in the back, self-guided tours, which are really cool. Anyway, the point I'm making, though, is that if we think about France and Spain, yes, they, some of them definitely do stay. Many die in large numbers. Mortality rates are just as high among travellers as they were among people in the Americas, they're being exposed to huge numbers of unfamiliar germs all at once. So lots of people come and stay and, and die. But we also have people who come as family members. We have an uh, amazing um, woman called, who we only know as Isabel, who is brought with her kind of common law husband. And she and their mixed heritage children settle in Spain. And they're basically living as a, a married couple until strangely he decides to marry a Spanish woman who unhelpfully for a historian telling this story is also called Isabel uh, and he then dies not long after and Isabel the Spanish woman decides to try and claim that Isabel the indigenous woman is enslaved and she and her children have to fight in the courts and this is how we know their story have to fight in the courts to assert their freedom and they do manage to successfully her assert their freedom. Her motivation being that you, you, uh, what, you can't baptise an enslaved person? Well, she wants to make them enslaved. She doesn't want to support them as children right. of her late husband. They, he, because he leaves them things in the will as well, and she doesn't want to give them that. Um, and they do prove their, their freedom. The thing is, they appear in the records because they end up going to court, but they're just, so we know a bit more about them, but they're typical of lots and lots and lots of people who come and do settle, especially across... France and, and Spain and Portugal. All right, let's have some questions from the floor. I have a policy of taking questions alternating between women and men. 
which is from a scientific study which showed that if women ask questions first and other women ask questions, I can't really see. Can you, you've got your head up, hand up, yes, and wait for the mic. Um, you've touched on um, the religious syncretism. Um, how much do you still see that alive in Latin America today? And um, also just quickly, with the York Museum, did you write and correct them after you visited? <laughs> so to take the second question first, I sent an email to the York Museum and they did not reply to me. Woke so nonsense. There you go. What can you do? Uh, you'd still see vast syncretism across Latin America today. Um, what Italians or French people would think of as Catholicism is not what Catholicism looks like in Central America. And you have, you still have a great survival of indigenous religions that in many cases have adopted the language of Jesu Cristo or of um, uh, kind of practices that come from Christianity, but still also have deep ties to nature and to the earth. You see, it's very different depending where you go and which community that you're talking to, but you see enormous amounts of survival. So for example, uh, you will often see in Catholic churches in Latin America, small dough figurines of parts of the body, for example, that people would like to heal. And that comes from indigenous traditions where you mold these little dough figurines that, and it's to do with worshiping maize and maize being tied to the earth. So that's just one small example of how you, you yeah, absolutely, it's, it's enormously the case still today. Gentleman down there on the third row. Um, I started reading your book yesterday and read about half it, so and thanks for the Thank talk you. and thanks for the interesting book. Um, I read a, a very short book a couple of years ago about the trade from the Americas to, I think it was to Mila, Manila and then China, kind of silver trade. And Do you know if many indigenous people were following that route over there, either as sailors or kind of slaves or what kind of research has been done on that side of things? Some do go to the West. Um, it is less uh, common but some do go to the West. And it's also really, really difficult to trace because, again, very helpfully for historians, the word that is used in Spanish sources for indigenous people is Indio, meaning Indian. And that's also the word they use for people from the East Indies. They call them Indios as well. So Nancy Van Doysen um, has an amazing book called Global Indios, if you're interested. And she talks about indigenous people coming to Europe, but also about how they get entangled with what's going on in the East and how people come from the East as well. And because you're not allowed, especially after 1542, to enslave indigenous Americans, um, you get debates in court records about whether Indios who are applying for their freedom are actually from the East or from the West. Some of you may have heard of Bartolome de las Casas, who's famous liberator of the indigenous peoples. Um, he's called the Defender of the Indians, is his official title. He even appears in court as a, a, an expert witness testifying whether people are from the Americas or not. It's super interesting how these stories all entwine. You, there is some, some exchange, but the Manila galleons carry almost exclusively goods, nearly always silver, and they don't tend to carry very much in the way of passengers. There is some. So there's a, a samurai in Mexico in the middle part of the 1500s. How many people know that there's a Mexican samurai? It's ama there's amazing stories. But there, that does, it does, the transport of people does tend to be exceptional rather than the rule, largely because the people, uh, the Eastern market in China and so on, the Western market, I suppose, from this point of view, only really want silver. They're not interested in trade goods and so on. And they make a film of that. It'll be Matt Damon playing that. Uh, playing the samurai, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching, Matt. Um, a question from Rachel Kay that came in online. Um, I think you slightly alluded to this already, but with, with this sort of changing perspective and the changing narrative of Indigenous people in, in, in Europe, are you seeing that there is more of a push for recognition or commemoration uh, in the same way that's, that reparations and commemoration for indigenous people from North America and from, from Africa are being recognised more? Yeah, we are seeing more of a push for it. It does tend still to be largely groups from the US and Canada who are asking for this kind of recognition and reparation, but not exclusively. The British Museum um, had a, a wonderful uh, four-day event that juxtaposed indigenous work on indigenous codices with indigenous ceremonies and so on. It was all live streamed and it was beautifully done. 
And so we are seeing more recognition of indigenous peoples from across the Americas, because this is something where there is a, a really tangible legacy. We have stuff here that comes from those travelers. Famously in Glasgow, they have a, a lot of indigenous objects that came with the Buffalo Bill um, uh, uh, shows, including objects that were from Wounded Knee. There was a baby's uh, shoe from the Wounded Knee massacre that was on display in Glasgow for a long time. Um, the Pitt Rivers Museum has um, cloaks and shirts that belong to indigenous peoples who are travellers. And so there are calls for reparation of, of not just human remains, which are sometimes the, the remains of uh, travellers, but also for, for objects and, and so on. So it, it is a, that story hasn't ended. You know, people are buried here, their descendants are here, their stuff is here. And, and while we're in an era of... of um uh, of asking for um, the loot from empire and uh, to be returned. Is there, are there any calls for any of the uh, objects in, for example, the Pit Rivers to go back? Oh, all the time. Right. Um, but they don't always want to give them back. The Pit Rivers have done some very good decolonizing work. Um, so they invited uh, lots of people from the Blackfeet community to come and work with the shirts, make replicas of the shirts, be with them, because th these shirts are considered to be there part of their ancestors in, in, in some ways. But even after that, the, the people who participated said, well, but why have they got them? Why have my children never seen one of these? And they've got five. You know, so they did do a lot of incredible work and they paid for that and, and facilitated it, but they still didn't give them back. Um, and th there are quite a lot of examples of where um, indigenous peoples have asked for things back and they, they've been refused. The Rapa Nui, the, the big... Mm. Um, head in the British Museum, for example, that's from um, what we, the British would call Easter Island. Um, the, yeah, there's infinite uh, And, and on, of ongoing, an ongoing conversation. Ongoing conversations. Uh, another question from the floor. I can see there's someone's hand up. I can't, sort of third row from the back. Hi, um, Hi, that was a great conversation, by the way. Um, I was wondering about the development of the casta system in Latin America, co colonial Latin America, um, which is this like heritage-based caste system, and how that relates to other forms of race science as championed by Europeans and Euro-Americans, and what the time frame on the development of that system and of the ideas around race uh, was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like half of this question at least is for you, really, about the <laughs> development of ideas around race. The caste system is established in Spanish American law in the 18th century. So for people who don't know, the it, where in Latin America they don't have the one drop rule you may have heard of in British America where one drop of black blood makes you black. Instead, they have many, many different categories. There are different names for people who are half white and half indigenous, one quarter black, one quarter indigenous, half white, for example, different words for all of those, and each of those people hold different statuses. Um, it does, of course, lead, it is part of that development towards scientific racism and classification of peoples as different kinds of races, absolutely. But it is, the phrase shades of grey seems wrong in this context. It is more uh, graduated than happens in the, um, the US, for example, where, where you have a very mm. uh, um, hard line. But you, you're better at talking about the development of race science than I am. Well, you were, again, you mentioned it earlier that the, 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 the principal component for the othering of people at this era is not based on pigmentation, but is based on, on religion and culture. And that is pretty much universal until about the 17th century when with the invention of scientific racism which largely comes out of the emerging field of biology with people like Linnaeus. I've got uh, 20 slides if you want so I can, <laughs> I, I, I can do this for a, a while but th those very specific rules come in m much later as mechanisms for control. Um, and I'm not sure whether that does answer your question but, but what, there was a, you said that was the first half of the question what was the second half? I don't think I did. Was there a two halves? A, I think that was a different question. D does that, does that answer that your question, or does that go some way to answering the question? Okay. It is a large question. Adam has written some books about it. Is <laughs> are available in it? No. Um, 
Look, fi finally, we've got time for a quick one. So if anyone's got one from the audience, get your hand up right now, otherwise it's going to come from me. What was it like? Oh, sorry, oh. I missed it. I couldn't see. Is someone here? Yes. Ver on the very yes. front row, I'm sorry. We're, it's like being interrogated with the lights. It's quite hard. We to can't see. really see you. Thank you. Um, you were talking about the French. Did they actually go to South America and Central America, like the Spanish? No, not in, in, not in this period, no. Um, not to any great degree. They do appear in the Caribbean, um, but no, pre the, it, not in um, Central America, but they are in Brazil very prominently. You have an awful lot of uh, French expeditions to... Um, no, that's the Portuguese, isn't it? Sorry, you've, it's been... Yeah. So many places. No, you get some French expeditions in, in the South American coast, but no, principally their efforts are further to the north, um, mostly in what is now Canada and was New France. You get some attempts to establish what's called France Antarctique, uh, which is um, in Central South America, but they only last about 20 years. There's not an awful lot of French influence in that part. Um, the stuff around France in, in my book is, is more about... Uh, is, is about the, the, the Tupi in Brazil, so you have some coastal stuff there. And you do have this incredible example of the French taking a huge number of indigenous people from Brazil and setting up an actual Brazilian village on the banks of the Seine, just outside Rouen in, in 1550. It's this incredible example. Um, but most of their efforts are in Canada and to the north. So you have some, some, yeah. Okay, final question from me. There's an amazing amount of research has, has gone into, into this. As, as I said, incredible detail about people and the legality and the, the real nitty-gritty of what's happening, but also set within the context of this bigger sweep of history, which is largely unknown outside, outside of the particular discipline. What are you up to now? What happens next? Oh. <laughs> I go to lots of places and talk to people about this. Um, when I, whenever I, pub, I publish a book, I find that in discussion, in things like this, when people ask questions, that actually it opens up a door that I haven't thought of. There's, the thing is, there is so much still about this that I want to write about. And so there, I'm going to do some more work on this, especially some academic work, um, trying to shift the field. Some, I have a, an amazing story that didn't make it into the book that I want to write an article about, about uh, indigenous converts in Paris. There's some amazing, um, where they, they literally have to lock them in a convent because people are beating around the door trying to see them. Because this, this, and we have, I found this source that, when I say found, it, it's a book. I mean, I'm not like, it wasn't under a carpet. I'm, <laughs> archivists do amazing work. But I, what I wasn't expecting was there to be so much about these people. Um, who come with a man called Abbeville, uh, a missionary to um, Paris. I expected there to be a couple of pages, and there were 100 pages about them. So I, I would really like to do some work on them. But I also am thinking about what the next book is, and that's a difficult kind of... I'm, I'm in that hole where you're try I'm trying to decide exactly what direction to take. And, but I, I want to keep talking about kind of humanising Indigenous people in the popular imagination and, and taking away from those stereotypes that so often dominate the way we think about them. Fabulous. So we can look forward to a sequel in two years, three? Two. Well, working on the basis of the gap between this book and my last book, then in 2038, you can look forward <laughs> to you my You heard it next. here first. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the book is on sale outside. I insist that you buy it. Caroline will be sitting and signing and taking more questions. Um, but all that remains is for me to ask you to thank Caroline Dodds-Pennock.